Today's topic is about a concern we are seeing right now. It's called a triple-demic, a situation where the flu, RSV, and COVID collide. So we might ask, is this a real concern or is it overblown in the news? We want to dig into that today. Uh, Patty Olinger is my co-host of this BioTalk. Patty, why don't you start us off and uh, tell us what's going on? Oh, thanks, Jeff. Um, you know, I've been getting a lot of questions also and have done some radio um, news spots to discuss what this, what is this triple demic and how many shots am I going to have to have? And, and, you know, is this RSV thing, is this a new thing that's out there or is what, you know, what is it? And, you know, it's one of those things that what we're trying to explain to people is that, you know, flu has been with us for a long time and we know it. And that also RSV is not something that's new, but we are seeing a resurgence, you know, probably because, you know, we have been social distancing, following certain work, you know, practices of washing our hands more often, you know, not touching our faces. And yeah. now all of a sudden we are looking at this potential of getting back together and all three viruses colliding. And with me today, I have two experts that, you know, I'm really excited to have, um, Dr. Donald Burke and John Cordier um, from Epistemics. And I am going to let them introduce themselves. Um, uh, John, if you'd like to start out. Yeah, thanks, Patty. Thanks, Jeff. I'm glad to be on today. Um, John Cordier, CEO at Epistemics. Uh, background has been working with the events industry to help bring the industry back over the last couple of years. We initially started to help the industry understand when can events come back, under what circumstances, under what conditions. And we've been providing forecasts of COVID um, across the industry for the last two years. Um, through that, and we've been looking at modeling things like the flu and RSV and other infectious diseases over time. Um, and we're beginning to build those things into forecasting and planning so that events can be prepared for that going forward. Um, Don, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, the uh, I'm Don Burke. Uh, I'm a infectious disease physician uh, and epidemiologist. I'm the uh, president of Epistemics uh, and also uh, the former dean of the Graduate School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, my specialty is infectious diseases, and so I think about these things a fair amount. Uh, the uh, So is this real? Most definitely, this is real. Uh, that already uh, many of the hospitals are being overwhelmed by RSV, uh, the, uh, the children's hospitals particularly, uh, that uh, influenza is ticking up, still hasn't taken off quite as much as RSV, um, and the background of uh, SARS-CoV-2 is there. And there's every sign that with new variants emerging um, almost every month or two, that uh, there will be a resurgence this winter as well. So the forces are aligned. All three are going to be going up about the same time. Um, and it can have a significant impact on not, not only the hospitals, but our daily lives. We're going to have to be a, a bit more careful. What kind of time frame are we talking about? Yeah, hard to know exactly on the crystal ball. But as I say, RSV is already... Uh, on the uh, is uh, growing around the country. Um, influenza typically doesn't occur until later December, January, but that could move up in other countries in the Southern Hemisphere. It's been a bit early, so we can expect that to be a bit early as well. Um, and uh, and I and in I think the SARS-CoV-2 in the last two years has peaked right around the end of the year, uh, and so that's a reasonable bet then too. But you know, those are you know, those are there's no solid prediction there. This is a little bit of crystal ballism, but uh, we can predict it reasonably well, but not down to the week or two weeks. So one of the questions that I have gotten on the on you know uh, news radio, as well as you know talking, my my son happens to be a chief resident in, uh, he's a surgeon, but the last two months he's been spending time in a children's hospital. 
And interestingly, a lot of the beds, as you indicated, are being filled with RSV patients and it's impacting um, on surgeries, you know, especially if it's an elective, but they're getting a lot of transfers from other hospitals that are full. Um, so this has a very big impact on our pediatrics and those of those who are immunocompromised as well, we know. Um, interestingly, why are we seeing, you know, in your opinion, your thoughts on RSV, you know, the, this, this large number of patients potentially, you know, coming into the children's hospitals when we haven't necessarily seen that in the past. Yeah. So what's going on here for all, uh, for all three of the viruses is that over the last two years through social distancing, all virus transmission has been decreased across the United States. So if you look at the usual number of reported cases of RSV or influenza, and it's, by the way, it's not just a triple-demic, it's a every virus you can think of demic uh, is the, uh, uh, because what has happened during that time is viruses just weren't being transmitted because of the social distancing and masking. Um, and as a consequence, Normally what would happen is kids who are one and two and three and four years old would be getting infected. But this you know, last two years, they haven't been. And so now there's a big population of kids who were not infected who normally would be. Uh, and then on top of that, there are a lot of people whose immunity is waning who might've been reinfected in the preceding two years who are now waiting and really are, are susceptible for infection. So there's a, a big pool of susceptibles, either young kids, newborns, um, kids in the first couple of years of life, or people whose immunity has waned over the last couple of years. And that's true, again, not only for, uh, for um, RSV, but it's true for flu and it's true for a lot of other diseases. So that's what's happened. Is some In France, they coined a term called immunity debt, the idea that you got to pay your dues sometime. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> what's happened is that we've got a two years worth of immunity then. Well, if we're not going to have a triple demic, let's call it something like what? Infinity demic? If it's going to yeah, be more than three. Well, yeah, like I say, uh, there, yeah, there, there is a limited number of viruses, but there are about 10 common viruses that go through the population. Most of them aren't that terribly serious. Uh, and so we don't really pay that much attention. They, they cause colds, but those are also backing up too. Uh, and so those are that's what those that's why I call it everything you can think of uh, mm -hmm. epidemic or demic. Uh, the uh, but there's about maybe a dozen uh, common ten to twelve common viruses. Yeah. Well, John, what are you thinking now about this? So we've actually been contacted by a couple of children's hospitals to date. Um, one is Connecticut Children's Hospital, and their concern is they're seeing so many cases right now that they're considering even opening up new facilities, uh, whether that be a community center and turning that into a temporary facility, or if it's going to be a multi-year, um, and if it goes on for a longer amount of time, uh, paying up our debt, is that going to be something that they might need to build a new facility for? So. Those are all things that we're getting asked to help forecast and better understand. So we're now just beginning to get into that sort of work to understand how many years is it going to take to pay up that debt and what's going to be the seasonal impact this winter going into next year. So the pandemic doesn't just end. It There's residuals that we're seeing that we're talking about today that we need to be concerned with. All right, Patty, yeah. anything to add? Yeah, you know, I mean, some of the things that that a lot of parents are asking and also grandparents and and uh, is what can we do? Because they, they recognize that, you know, as you send kids off to school, it's that what we used to, what we would call that Petri dish of sending kids, you know, they're going to get infected with things. Um, we don't live in a sterile environment. And as we start to get back out into populations, these, you know, exposures are going to happen. But what can we do to protect, um, you know, our families and our kids, especially if we have, you know, uh, these little teeny ones, you know, that haven't built their immunity systems up yet, or, um, you know, a family member who's immunocompromised, or as we're getting older, you know, what does that look like? 
And what we've been explaining to people is number one, if there's a vaccine available, like with COVID or with flu, go get your vaccine. It's your one way that you know that you can provide some protection. The other is, you know, we've been sequestering ourselves. We've been wearing masks. If, 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 if you are in that vulnerable population, wear a mask. I mean, it's so important, um, especially if you're having symptoms and you have to go out in public, you want to protect others as well. And so wear that mask when it, when it matters. Um, wash your hands, you know, you know, we can't say enough about that. Um, we've, we did a really good job there for a while in the very beginning of the pandemic. And when we couldn't wash our hands, we were all carrying around, you know, a bottle of it, you know, hand sanitizer. Um, I just dusted mine off and put it back on my purse to carry it with me again. And it's one of those things that, you know, it, it's there and it's something we can use. And then for our industry, Jeff, you know, it really is important to pay attention to how we clean. And it's not just, you know, making things look nice and smell pretty, but we do clean. And so let's clean correctly and let's clean for health. It's not creating a sterile environment. Um, Look at those points, you know, when we clean and disinfect that we touch a lot, and especially in businesses and pay attention to our indoor air. It's such an important aspect. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else that some that you guys would like to add? Because um, this is really, as we're heading into the winter months and we're all going to be inside a lot more, um, this is really a very important topic. I have a question for Dr. Burke, if I could. Sure. Um, you know, I go to my doctor and I, I think many doctors out there, um, they don't talk about cleanliness or vitamins or all the things that we might do as a routine part of our life. What is your perspective when it comes to cleaning and indoor air quality when we're thinking about these infectious diseases? Yeah, so all of these respiratory diseases are uh, potentially transmitted by indoor air, by aerosol. And so having a a mechanism that either cleans the air or circulates the air frequently is one of the important ways to decrease risk. Uh, If you don't have that, if you're at home, if the weather permitting, you know, try to get as much aeration as you can. Another thing is that if you're sick yourself, uh, if you if you can, if you particularly if you've got the sick leave policy, stay home and don't infect other people. So, um, you know, and as you say, the um, good nutrition is always a smart thing to do, uh, not only for infectious diseases but for general health. All right. And what about you, John? Uh, I don't think there's anything else to add, but okay. you know, tying it back to the the audience, I know there's a lot of venue managers and event folks out there. So looking at this as getting ahead, using data to help inform what decisions you're going to be making into the fall and into the winter, um, same way that we were able to help manage this over the last couple of years, you can rely on the data and it might not give you the exact here's the day and two week window where cases are going to be at their highest. Use it. Use the data like a weather forecast. We're able to say, here's about the time that we need to change our behaviors and really look at it from a behavior change standpoint, rather than just saying, here's a point estimate and here's exactly what we should do on this day of the week. Really just use it as a guiding principles for what behaviors event uh, planners and venue or not, venue managers can can put in place to keep people safe when they're gathering together indoors. Yeah. I know uh, many have been surprised by what's happened and have never seen this type of uh, growth of infectious diseases and the issues we have, especially with events in their careers, might be the same with you folks, but we do want our industry to clean, disinfect, be safe, make sure not that just the surfaces, but the air is clean as well. Patty, you want to wrap it up for us? Well, um, at, at the end of the day, we all want to be safe. Um, you know, our health is something that we need to pay attention to because the more healthy we are, the more, you know, we can keep healthy and, and maybe have a better immune system, you know, against these diseases. Uh, they're not going to go away. Uh, we realize that. Um, and as we become a population that moves around as much as we do nowadays and all of the climate issues that we're dealing with, 
we realize that this is something that's going to be with us for a while and probably forever. And we can't let our guard down. Um, so thanks everybody for being here today. And hopefully this message gets out to those who, who really need it, which is really every industry, um, parents, grandparents, um, and, uh, and stay safe.